for a researcher like me, catching a plane could represent 90% of my carbon footprint. Really, reducing flying is the fastest way to reduce their carbon footprint. Taking all these ships and merchant marine boats, and it sounds um, exotic. It sounds romantic, but then when you sleep for 10 days on a cargo ship and uh, you have to deal with the mites every night, you know, when mites bite you, you wake up because it's really painful. You cannot sleep. There is nothing you can do and you just have to wait that the mites finishing their banquet on your body and so you can get on to sleep. There are many moments in which I ask myself, why on her time am I doing it? But I'm determined to do it. Partly because of this promise, uh, this commitment that I have uh, with the people in Bougainville. Partly because, yeah, I mean, now I feel that I have the attention of uh, all over the world on my travel because yeah. <laughs> my story has really attracted so much attention worldwide yeah. that uh, I feel kind of under surveillance. Around the world, every single day, there's something like 100,000 flights. Like, uh, flights. Is that all? So nearly a million a week, <laughs> every week. Yeah, something like well, three that. Three quarters so, of a million. Like I exaggerate. At any one moment, there's something like 500,000 people up in the air, which is, for those of you who want a translation, everything comes back to the size of Canberra. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's a small city, uh, a medium-sized city, actually, up in the air a, at any one A thriving time. city with a lot of opportunities for culture and cafes. <laughs> yeah, that too. Yeah. That too. Uh, or, or you can do it, you multiply that over the course of a day, and mm. it's thought that something around 6 million people take a flight every single day, which if you step back from the, the population of the planet is- Tiny. 0.1%, <laughs> which is, is not nothing, but every single day, oh, one. one in a thousand people take a flight, take a flight, take a flight. Wow. It doesn't take a lot to work out that flying has an absolutely massive impact on the planet. But if it's in the air, it's not touching the planet, so it should be fine. Uh, 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 so there's 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 the greenhouse gases, yeah, yep. straight. Um, well, carbon dioxide release, but also there's there's a few other greenhouse gases that are coming out of the back of the tailpipe of the plane. Yep. And that's about one point nine percent of the total uh, well, the damage greenhouse gases. No, oh, no, just the greenhouse, gases. just the greenhouse right, gases. Okay. Um, it, it adds up a bit more in, in carbon dioxide. But if you go straight to what is the impact of flights on uh, temperature, Yeah, it's about 4%. So 4%. Four. Yeah. The, Not even trying. That's, <laughs> that's the radiant enforcing. But the thing is, it's, it's kind of, this is a bad metaphor. Okay. Only going up. Well done. Unlike planes, it's not landing. That's the problem. Let's extend that metaphor or that analogy. But it doesn't have to be that way. No. There are other ways that we can travel, other ways that we can uh, get around the planet. They might not be as fast and they might not make you popular, but uh, we're here today to talk to someone who's in the middle of a journey, a journey from one side of the planet to the other side of the planet. It's uh, Gianluca Grimalda. Welcome to The Wholesome Show. Hello, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Now, listener, uh, listener and producer, you may hear some tones behind Gianluca. Uh, that's the sound of the cargo ship. His foot ship. massage. He's getting a foot massage while he talks. <laughs> foot massage. From a machine. And cargo ship. <laughs> I wish that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> no. You're normally based in Germany, right? Uh, your job is in Germany? Correct. Uh, but you were out um, in Papua New Guinea. What brought you out to Papua New Guinea? Yes, I spent uh, seven months uh, in Bougainville, uh, a province of Papua New Guinea, to study social adaptation to climate change. I'm a social scientist, uh, and that is my fourth uh, field work here in Bougainville mm. to understand uh, how people adapt uh, to climate change. Yeah. So on the climate change, what sorts of impacts are they seeing and how are they responding to that? Coastal communities I visited already had uh, an instance of relocation inland because of sea level rise. Already? God. Yes, actually all of them. So sea level rise is a big thing, probably because uh, it's uh, matched with the process of uh, land sinking as well. So my understanding is that the Australian tectonic plate is uh, getting over the Solomon Islands tectonic plate. So this causes uh, the land to go down in the Solomon Islands. Is that another thing that Australia is doing to the Pacific? Yes, I think is. we're ruining the Pacific in another way. I didn't know that one. Even when we don't try, we yeah. manage. Yeah, it's great. The other thing that it's probably even worse 
is that uh, for many communities, uh, when the drought season comes, uh, they have no food. Mm. So the dry season is uh, a period of drought that normally would take about uh, three weeks every year. Now, six weeks, maybe even eight weeks. And so during this period, uh, uh, people are, are really in a situation of uh, famine. So they have uh, to ask food oh. from their own extended families. Look, it yeah. certainly brings it home. I mean, you're... You're a climate researcher, and I said all of those stats about flights before, but uh, you're seeing people that are affected by climate change directly. You're seeing people moving houses, people dealing with famine. Is, is that something that you, you really think about, you know, when you're making choices in your own life? Yes, of course, seeing these people that literally lack their food when, uh, when the drought season comes. Um, affected uh, actually my own decision to slow travel back to, to Europe and uh, to say no to my employer when they told me you must catch a plane now because you are late. I made uh, this promise to all the participants in my research. So 1800 people uh, participated in my research. And I told all of them, you, you know, you are suffering and it's not your responsibility. Because uh, you produce uh, probably around uh, 300 kg of CO2 every year. People from Europe, like me, produce about uh, 9.7 tons of CO2 yearly. People from the United States uh, produce uh, around 20.7 tons of CO2 on average, of course. And so I just want to show you that uh, I'm with you, I'm close with you, and uh, I'm going to go back to Europe, minimizing the environmental impact of my travel. So I'm going to catch uh, ferries, um, cargo ships, uh, trains, uh, coaches, uh, because in this way, the carbon footprint uh, of my travel will be 10 times uh, lower as uh, what I would produce uh, if I caught a plane. So I, according to my computations, uh, catching a plane would produce about uh, five tons of CO2. That's actually more than what uh, the average person in the world produces in one year. By slow traveling, I produce a 500 kg, which is probably more than what one person from Papua New Guinea produces in one year. But it's still, it's a lot, but it's uh, 10 times less. So that was uh, my way to really show that I'm close to them. Actually, 80% of the people in the world will never put a foot on a plane. Mm. Yeah. Only 4 or 5% will fly regularly every year. So we should not forget that uh, taking a plane, catching a plane, is uh, an elite activity. It's something that uh, only the wealthy people around the world uh, can afford. And uh, it is true that uh, overall uh, the, em the emissions associated with the aviation industry are 5%. This projected to grow exponentially because uh, the demand for flying has been growing like uh, yeah. fourfold over yeah. 20 years. But for a researcher like me, catching a plane could uh, represent 90% of my carbon footprint. So it's uh, as high as that. So for people who do have the chance to catch a plane, really reducing flying is uh, the fastest way to reduce their carbon footprint. Mm. Do you feel a bit like Indiana Jones? Like it's, it, sounds, it sounds very romantic. I'm guessing the reality is maybe not so much taking all these ships and merchant marine boats, and it sounds um, exotic. Yes, exactly. I mean, it sounds romantic, but then when uh, you sleep for 10 days on a cargo ship and uh, you have to deal with the uh, mites uh, every night, uh, you know, uh, many times you think, uh, why on earth am I doing it? Because, you know, when, when mites bite you, you wake up because it's really painful. You cannot sleep. So you have, a, there is nothing you can do. And you just have to wait that the mites are finishing their banquet on your body. <laughs> and so you can get on to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> You've got mice. What are the other, what are the other tough things that you have to put up with uh, in this long, long trip home? There are a lot of beautiful things. I, I have, um, uh, I have published uh, the photo of a beautiful sunset. I mean, you can only get uh, these uh, photos uh, with uh, these very peaceful, very relaxing environments where you are in the middle of the ocean. But I would say, yeah, what uh, I really have to put up with is, uh, well, first of all, the uncertainty. Yeah. Because uh, many times uh, I really don't know when I will sleep in that night yeah. uh, after I get my, you know, paperwork or my things done. You know, when I traveled here, 
I wasn't sure I would have been able to cross the border between Pakistan and India mm. after I actually did it. Because uh, many people told me the visa that you have is not valid to cross the border on foot. So I would say the uncertainty is uh, is not uh, is not something that I particularly welcome. But uh, yeah, you have uh, to get used to it. That is a very high level of uncertainty <laughs> to get used to. A lot of people yes. tap out before that level of uncertainty. You're you're well in the yeah. high tolerance there. I think he's, he's in the one percent. And in the place where I'm here now, this is just an example. But basically, they told me I cannot uh, get out alone. So now I'm really like in a in a, in a bunker in a way. Uh, I'm staying in the dwarf of um, the ship company that uh, hosts me and uh, I'm only allowed uh, to get out uh, under escort. They told me it's too dangerous uh, uh, as a white man, yeah. as we are always referred to here in uh, PNG. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, too dangerous for you to get out alone. You could be subject of uh, robberies, uh, kidnapping. So I always have to get out under escort. I've only been to Port Moresby. It's the only, only place I've been anywhere there. And it was for a conference with UNESCO and it was very well secured. We we're in a hotel compound and it's the only place I've been in the world where they said to us, okay, look, for tourists, if you're interested in walking around the city, don't. And, and this is in tourist literature in the hotel room. And then they also said, but if you really need to, take two of our guards with you. And they had guards all around the hotel. And I, I just remember this was nothing. I mean, we're in this, the, the center of the main town in a nice hotel being looked after by an international agency. And they were saying, this is crazy. And I won't go into the other story. Some of the participants in this meeting, the horrible things that happened to them just outside of town. So where you were and have been, I can't even imagine how frightening that would be. Yes, it's true. I've also been in Port Mosby. I ventured uh, alone quite a few times and nothing happened to me. But of course, uh, this doesn't mean that uh, the risk uh, is, uh, is negligible. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think uh, you, you have to trust uh, your instinct and the trust of the locals. But you know what? There, there is something else going on there. You've mentioned a few security risks to you in, uh, in the research that you're doing in, in New Guinea, uh, but also in crossing, crossing tricky borders, avoiding potential conflict zones in Russia, <laughs> Ukraine, Iran, uh, maybe, or obviously uh, Israel, Palestine at the moment. And I wouldn't say a lot of those insecurity situations are directly contributed by climate change. But, but we know we know that climate change is likely to exacerbate all sorts of tensions around the world. You increase famine, uh, de decrease water supplies. Mm. You you make it so there's less farming land, and it mm. makes people all the more insecure. And I think there is something there that uh, the a lot of this uh, rich part of the world is insulated and protected. We can skirt over the top of these things in an aeroplane for now, and for now, for now, while making the problem worse. Yes, absolutely. Many people say that the war in Syria, for instance, was caused by a major drought so mm. that uh, different uh, groups uh, clashed uh, to get access to, to water. And that has already completely changed the political landscape uh, in Europe and uh, possibly in the world. So what you are saying is uh, absolutely true. So, yeah, in a way, I try to explore yeah, the extent to which this alternative way of travel is uh, feasible in today's world. And of course, if there are major security threats, I will reconsider my travel yeah. plans. Yeah. But I mean, I managed to come here almost uh, exclusively no fly. And I mean, it went very well. Yeah. And let me add uh, something about uh, really the, the interest in um, that I have as a researcher in this type of travel. So Pakistan to me was a, a very interesting country. Uh, because uh, last year they have been affected by major floodings. Uh, 2,000 people died. Uh, 2 million people had uh, to be evacuated because of uh, floodings. When I was traveling there, first of all, I saw all the rivers uh, were dry. So I really couldn't uh, uh, figure out uh, how there could be floodings. But clearly when the summer season comes, it's uh, so hot, uh, then, then uh, humidity um, makes uh, really rainfall torrential. Yeah. But th this is not the first thing that uh, hit me. What, what I knew is that uh, Pakistan is one of the countries with the highest uh, mortality rates uh, for road accidents in the world. 27,000 people die on roads uh, in Pakistan. <laughs> and uh, I got on coaches and there are no seat belts. On cars, there are no seat belts. Right. And I said, how on her, the, can that be? So I asked the, my um, fellow traveler, why is that? 
And he told me, because uh, God has already decided what is going to happen to you. So you are uh. going to die, whether you wear a seatbelt or not, if you have to die. You know, in local language, they must have a word for yes, but they never say yes. They would always say, inshallah, mm -hmm. God willing. So for them, it's really everything is about a fatalism. So they think that the future is a predetermined, it's already written. And basically, whatever you do, whether climate change will come about or not, it doesn't depend on your actions. It will come whether you act against it or not. I spoke with some policemen and I asked them, what are you going to do for next year's crisis? Because of for sure flooding will come again. And their answer was nothing, absolutely nothing. So, I mean, I was completely astonished by what I heard. And uh, that taught me two things, really, how cultural differences can make a big impact in the way populations adapt and uh, even fight against climate change. And uh, it, it also taught me how really interesting for me is to slow travel because I, I can get the chance to really speak with uh, so many people and learn from people I would otherwise never meet. Years ago, we, we did a, a, a public show for our Australian Greens Party, and we were speaking to their leader at the time. And I've, I've worked some, just again with UNESCO in, around Pacific Islands, not much in uh, Papua New Guinea, but they were telling us a story where they went over to, I think I think it was the Marshall Islands, I've got that wrong, and they were talking to people in a big sort of community hall about the effects of climate change and how it will affect their areas in particular, and they were showing catastrophic images that, that were real. And um, they said they looked around the room and they saw all these, these faces were kind of beaming and looking delighted, and it was because the, the influx of extremely hardcore Christianity that said basically the sooner that happens, the sooner it's the rapture and the sooner we are taken up. And so they were quite kind of delighted by the idea that this was coming sooner rather than later. And speaking of cultural difference, and I just think, how do you how do you talk to people about climate change when they they're like, this is great, like it's, it's either in China, you know, it's going to happen anyway, or it's like this is excellent, we get to heaven faster. I have done some, let's say, social psychology and uh, communication about climate change. So the basic lesson is that you have to speak with the language of the person you are talking with. So you have to try to understand their values and make them understand that what you want to transmit is expressed in, in their own system of culture and their own language. So I think, yeah, well, the example you talked about is a, a very specific, a very hard one. But in principle, I suppose you can always try to make them understand that it's in their benefit, uh, maybe short term benefit uh, to do something to adapt uh, against climate change. Look, I think there's some battles also you just can't yeah. win. You know, you just have to say that this is too, the differences are too great. That's that's my feeling anyway. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, I, I have the same doubt with respect to climate deniers. So sometimes I think. Uh, Maybe it's just a waste of time to engage with the climate deniers because they are just uh, in a completely different mindset. I've read an article that said that uh, it, it, that's not true. So that, that, that there, there are some marginal, let's say, improvements or some marginal shifts that they can do uh, by listening to you. But yeah, overall, I also wonder whether maybe it's just a waste of time. So, so let's go through your your trip then. Uh, so, getting from Bougainville back to Germany, what is the what is the plan? What uh, what sorts of ferries and boats and trains and buses and things will you be taking? Yeah, it, it's mapped out, but um, I must be flexible because there are many things, and many parts of the travel that I cannot be booked in advance. Mm. So, for instance, something that I'm quite fearful now is whether Iran might um, get involved into the war in Israel. So if that is the case, I will probably have to um, try to circumvent uh, Iran. And uh, I will have uh, to apply for visas. Uh, fortunately, now uh -huh. applying for visas is uh, much, much easier than in the past. So countries like Iran and Pakistan accept um, online visas, so that makes uh, uh, the process much, much easier. The most difficult thing is uh, getting out of this island because they are in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Uh, there are very few uh, freight uh, ships uh, and uh, even less uh, passenger ships. So that is uh, the most difficult thing. 
So I managed to find um, the owner of a cargo ship uh, who allowed me on board. It wasn't easy. I had uh, to ask many people before one said yes. <laughs> we asked authorization to the Papua New Guinea uh, National Maritime Authority. They said yes, perhaps with some surprise. And, and so I, I caught the first cargo ship. I arrived here in Rabaul in um, the uh, East New Britain. And I, I hoped that there would be another cargo ship ready, but that hasn't worked as planned. So basically I'm stranded here for 10 days. Uh. So I'm going to catch another ferry next week, Friday next week. And then it will be much easier while I am in the island of Papua. So from there, I am confident I can get to the border with the Indonesia pretty quickly. And then in Indonesia, they have um, a national ferry company that will take me to Singapore after about 10 days of travel. Wow. And yeah. then I have already traveled uh, several times from Singapore to Europe. Uh, this time I'm going to try something different because I cannot possibly travel through Russia. So I will travel by train and coaches uh, through uh, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, China, and then I will cross the border to Pakistan near the basically Himalaya range. Wow, that's beautiful. Then yeah. go down. Yeah, it will be beautiful. That's the first <laughs> time that I do it. I really look forward to that. Then I'll get south. Uh, I'll cross the border to Iran, hopefully. And then I will travel up north to Turkey, catch a ferry to Greece, catch a ferry to Italy, and then I'll be home, basically. What's your window on the estimate? Do you, I mean, do you have meetings booked um, or anything <laughs> like that at the other end? Are you getting back for your brother's birthday or anything oh, like can you that? Imagine? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't make it because I, I was held up by gangsters on the edge of Pakistan border. Do you, do you know? Like, I'm going to be late. How many days do you reckon? I do have a sub commitment back in Germany. I have to be in a trial, so I have to be there as quick as possible because probably the trial will start in December. <laughs> okay. So I would say between, yeah, around 50 days. 50 days. Okay. Wow. Cost, what do you reckon? Obviously, you, you're paying for hotels in different parts of this and, you know, there is there is food all the way through. But do you have a sort of estimate on the amount of literally the travel and how much it will cost? Yes. So that's something that many people ask me. For sure, slow travel costs more than catching a plane. It's probably between 50% and um, 100% more. Okay. So it's not uh, terribly expensive. And uh, what uh, really costs more is um, visas. So visas can be yeah. very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I was guessing, you know, each of these, each of these ferries, each of these trains would just continue to add up to be quite a lot more expensive. Mm. So saying, you know, 50 to hundred percent more is not a lot. What you should do is make your comparisons to business class travel and then it'll sound better. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Actually, you know, on the cargo ship where I am now, I, I'm very lucky, but I'm not paying anything. I haven't paid anything for the ticket. I'm not paying anything ah. for the room. So oh, cool. I cannot what? complain too much about my <laughs> do, do you have to do you have to do some cargo ship work as well? They carry some barrels or something like that? No, I mean it's uh, it's very nice to see that some people are very, very kind. Oh, that's of that course, is. I, actually I gave I gave the owner of the ship a, a bottle of uh, Australian wine. Ooh. Little sign of appreciation, but yeah, uh, yeah I, 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 I'm, I've not been requested to, to pay anything in cash. I wait, wait till you're further out into the ocean, and then suddenly the uh, the prices will start to change. <laughs> so there are many moments uh, in which I ask myself, uh, why on the earth am I doing it? But uh, yeah, in the end, I'm determined to do it. Uh, partly because of this promise, uh, this commitment that I have uh, with the people in Bougainville. And uh, partly because, yeah, I mean, now I feel that I have the attention of uh, all over the world on my travel because yeah. <laughs> my story has really attracted so much attention worldwide yeah. that uh, I feel kind of under surveillance. Look, a big part of the story that uh, Gianluca's story is that his bosses said to him, no, nah, this is too slow, buddy. You've got emails to answer. You've got, uh, I don't know, some meetings or whatever it is. A grant work, application to fill in. Or work something. is required. Yeah. You need to be back at your desk. This is too slow. Low. So what's going on here? Yes, actually, my employer was not abused with the delay of about seven weeks to my <laughs> field work. That was not due to me, you know, sunbathing on a beach, but there were serious uh, security threats. At one point, we were held hostage by 
uh, gangsters uh, wielding machete and asking a ransom to get all my belongings back. Oh. So yeah, the, 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 this is part of the Bougainville experience. It's the first time that it happens to me. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it, it has happened. I tried to venture into areas that were not uh, clearly safe to me. And uh, this is what happened. Then uh -huh. there was a volcano activity that uh, stopped activities uh, for another couple of weeks. So all these uh, things happened. And uh, yeah, let's say my institute did not appreciate that uh, I really wanted to, I really needed to stay here for all this period to really complete my data set. Yeah. I, I set as a target to have uh, 30 villages to have enough variation in terms of exposure to climate change. And uh, I mean, I was determined to get this finished and I wasn't even thinking that uh, being delayed would be a matter of uh, getting fired. But this is precisely what uh, happened. So after, the the main bosses of my institute back in Germany realized that um, I was that late. They uh, organized a, a video call and they told me, OK, now you have to be back here in five days. So you have to jump on a plane in three days. Otherwise, you are fired. Uh -huh. And they know very well that I have been practicing what I call conscientious objection to flying for the last 13 years. Wow. In the past, they always approved my slow travel. Even for this travel, we made an allowance of five weeks of slow travel to come here and seven weeks to get back. So it didn't come as a surprise when I told them, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I'm not catching a flight. I'm sticking with my slow travel. If you want to fire me, fire me. So what changed? Why did they change their minds on this then? Well, you have to ask them. Okay, we'll you get them on. Them. <laughs> For them, it's uh, unimaginable that somebody can be seven weeks late. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I do like the idea that it's unimaginable for someone to be seven weeks late. <laughs> yeah, but you know, things that can go wrong on a field work in, in Bougainville. Uh, if I want to think badly, and in Italy we say that uh, if you think badly, you are right. They basically wanted to punish me for my past involvement in civil disobedience. So uh, last year I, w I became very active in a radical, always a nonviolent uh, action of civil disobedience uh, to protest against uh, the inaction on climate related issues and on the transition to a zero carbon economy. Mm. Last year they already threatened me to fire me if I had uh, got on with these kind of activities. And actually, I got on with this type of activities, but they could not fire me for that because uh, they, you cannot possibly fire your employee for what uh, he does uh, in uh, his spare time. Yeah. So maybe they just waited the, the first uh, occasion, the first uh, infringement of the rule to really get very harsh on me. M many people criticize me because they say, if you really wanted to save uh, emissions, then uh, you should not travel at all. And... Um, <laughs> I normally hit back saying that if I wanted to minimize my emissions, I should kill myself. <laughs> so I produce really zero carbon, uh, but I, I'm not prepared to do that. But I mean, to some extent, I, I, I'm also mindful that every travel we do uh, does a create a cost. So I have also cut down on a, a lot of my travels. So even these uh, travel back, you know, you know it's, uh, it's going to cost uh, 500 kg of CO2. So it's, it's something, it's not really negligible. So, but I, I thought that uh, overall, um, it was good to come here because uh, I study climate adaptation. I gave uh, several feedback to the local people all the local communities that uh, I um, traveled to, they had uh, close to no idea about uh, why climate change was happening. They saw no. it because yeah. they saw they saw food, um, the, 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 the harvest not being as good, as plentiful as before, but they didn't know why. So they really thanked me for the awareness talk, as they call it, uh, that uh, I gave. So on balance, I thought uh, it was justified that uh, you uh, travel here, but I would like uh, to say that uh, every travel, I mean, every time I embark on a, on a trip, I really ask myself, is this uh, really necessary? I mean, I'm not uh, the kind of person who like uh, lecturing out uh, to others, uh, telling others uh, what uh, they ought to do. But at least uh, I try to share my thoughts. And at the moment, uh, my thought is that we are literally seeing uh, the ecosystems uh, collapsing in front of our eyes. And so many people tell me, uh, okay, you've done 
an insane thing by the giving up your job uh, because you didn't want to catch uh, an intercontinental plane once. But I think in this uh, era of uh, climate collapse, the really mad thing is to get on with the business as usual to get on assuming that we can get on with the standard, you know, consumption patterns that we have or energy consumption patterns that we have as if uh, the resources on Earth uh, were unbounded. So with this experience, I'm really trying to get people think outside the box and uh, think that, uh, you know, inviting people to push the boundaries of what they consider normal during a climate crisis. So I think uh, overall I have uh, the a high enough uh, impact with my story that uh, I think even losing my job was uh, justified on the grounds of uh, the kind of uh, return that uh, I have had. Fantastic, Gianluca. Uh, we'll be following on your journey. I hope uh, not too many mice and not too many uh, border disputes. Have a good trip home. Thank you. Thank you for following me.